Good morning, everybody. Happy Saturday and welcome to the 19th annual celebration of Fiesta Latina. Uh, I'm Chris Norris from the Yale Peabody Museum, and we are delighted to be learning together with you about traditional and contemporary Latin American cultures during Hispanic Heritage Month. Today, we're going to be talking about farming. And when we talk about farming, we're talking about our relationship with the land. And we want to begin by acknowledging the current and ancestral stewards of the land that we're calling in from. Yale University acknowledges that indigenous peoples and nations, including the Mohegan, the Mashantucket Pequot, the Eastern Pequot, Pequot the Scattercook, the Golden Hill Pagusset, the Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. We also want to celebrate and appreciate the many organizational partners and sponsors who've made this year's celebration possible. Um, thanks to our founding partner, partner, Junta for Progressive Action, the Yale Latino Networking Group for co-hosting this year's celebration, and to Gather New Haven, the New Haven Free Public Library, the New Haven Museum, and Arte Incorporated for programmatic and outreach efforts. And thank you also to our generous sponsors whose support is making it possible for us to gather in this online space together. Fiesta Latina is sponsored by Avangrid Foundation and Univision with additional support from the International Association of New Haven. Translation and interpretation for Fiesta Latina is made possible by the Council on Latin American and Iberian Studies at the Yale Macmillan Center. And now we'll hear a few words from the folks at the Avangrid Foundation. Hello and welcome to Viesta Latina. I'm Nicola Caracrant from the Alvin Good Foundation. We're proud to sponsor and support the 19th annual Fiesta Latina, organized by the Yale Peabody Museum, the Junta for Progressive Action, and the Yale Latino Networking Group. The Alvin Good Foundation is the primary philanthropic arm of your power company, United Illuminating and Southern Connecticut Gas. One of our missions at the Alvin Good Foundation is to shine a light on the culture and the heritage of the people and the places that we call home. And we are excited to bring this celebration of culture and tradition to families across Connecticut and the country. From all of us here at the Alvin Good Foundation, esperamos que disfrute Fiesta Latina 2021. So a few housekeeping notes um, for being together in Zoom. Um, we have closed captioning and live interpretation available for this program. Both features can be accessed through the meeting controls at the bottom of your screen. And for any questions you might have during the program, please use the Q&A feature. Please use the chat feature if you have observations to share or if you're having technical difficulties. So on to the program. Today, we are honored to be joined by Sochi Garcia, farmer and assistant program manager of the farm-based wellness program with Gather New Haven at the Ferry Street Farm. Gather New Haven's a farm-based wellness program with three farms that provide fresh organic produce to participants and New Haven residents. We're grateful and delighted to be joining you out on the farm today, Sochi, and we're looking forward to learning about farming and your passion for growing food and community. Hi everyone, my name is Sochil and I would like to welcome everyone here at our Ferry Street Farm. Currently right now I'm standing in front of over 20 community plots which are designated to residents or anyone who's interested in maintaining a little plot of land throughout the summer season. And we are able to provide tools and supplies to be able to grow pretty much anything that grows in New England and we just give everyone the autonomy and freedom to just manage how they like within their plot boundaries and we're more than happy to provide any additional resources whether it's um 
any books or just coming us to us farmers just to know more about any agricultural techniques or if they have an excess of things we're more than welcome to actually sell at our farm and people are able to keep whatever we sell to them and so right now i am standing in front of kale some dying tomatoes some marigolds and some basil over here so a lot can be grown in such a small area of land and we actually encourage people to grow whatever they like um one of our most our biggest crop here is really the corn but they actually just finished producing its fruit um some people grow their ethnic foods like african eggplant or culantro and we we don't tell people what to grow again they grow what they like here and yeah pretty much i don't want to speak too much because i also want to move forward to a short video that i'd like to um present to everyone so chuck if you'd like to play that video has been part of my family lineage for generations, except I was the first one to be raised without it. A year ago, I decided to dismantle that fate and become an urban farmer at Gather New Haven. Urban farming is more than just food production. It's reconnecting with my ancestors through land and water. It's regaining a lifestyle that was once a basis of survival. It's actively sharing my farm knowledge to those who may have limited access to the field. I also had to be comfortable with ranges of humidity and temperatures, cuts or bruises from weeding, sore muscles from prepping beds, finding a new passion with making flower bouquets, and accepting that not everything will grow as planned. All of the work that goes towards the farm transcends throughout Gather, especially at the farm-based wellness program. This is Jonathan Savage, the farm manager at Gather New Haven. He will talk about his memorable times and lessons as an urban farmer. Being an urban farmer to me is a lifestyle. It's learning how to grow in probably one of the hardest type of environments to grow safely in. It's not just about the food when you're urban farming. It's about saying hi to the neighbor who goes by and uh, letting the kids from the neighborhood come look at the garden or trying to get them to come look at the farm. It means that you're actually cooperating, communicating, and collaborating with the urban environment to farm. I think most farmers are growing for grocery stores. There's no actual personal touch to it, as opposed to when I have the market stand and I don't have an item and somebody wants it, I can bring it to the farm stand next week and they come back next week so we actually, you build friendships and kind of relationships around it. And it kind of opens up uh, the ability to kind of touch people in different ways other than just here's some food that's good for you. You know, you should eat it. There's many teachable moments. Last week we had a young lady come. She wrote out a list of, I don't know, 20 indigenous herbs and plants and tag them with their uses like these five are medical and these five are just for seasoning and spices and these five are like candy and they're good to just have and you can eat them and they're nutritious and, um, and then she told us she's like these are all Native American herbs that have been used by my people for the last hundreds of years and they're things that I just walk by and kind of just take for granted you know they're good but you don't pay attention to the actual significance of them um, and all season's been like that, people kind of giving their own personal cultural take or look on the normal vegetables that I kind of see all the time and don't think about as like significant in that way. Jonathan mentioned how urban farming is about saying hi to the neighbor that walks by. I have a story that connects to that point. 
It all started when I was talking with Jonathan when he suddenly waved and said hello to an elder woman who was standing across the street. I instinctively said hola because she didn't respond to English. I asked her to come over. Her name is Doña Clotilde. For several weeks, she has watched us at the farm right from her house on the third floor. Doña Clotilde felt nervous to walk into the farm and ask for produce because she feared that no one spoke Spanish. I reassured her there's usually someone that speaks it, and if there isn't, they can always phone me to translate. She asked if she can have some tomatoes, and I gladly brought her inside the farm, gave her a small basket, and said, help yourself. I usually don't encourage new visitors to harvest their own produce, but since she was a farmer back in rural Mexico, I trusted her. Before she left, she said, Bendigo a esta granja, bendigo a la marqueta, y la bendigo a usted. In short translation, she blessed the farm, the market, and me. This moment made me rethink what community means on a personal level. We think community as an end goal, but what about the process to have or spark new community? Cotide came to the farm a few weeks later, and this time she bought a watermelon and some flowers. Another story that I'd like to share was the time I taught the concept of cycles to my farm-based wellness youth participants. All of them have only seen food as a product at the grocery store, a place where food seems endless. Around mid-September, the tomato plants stopped producing fruit for the season. Someone asked, Sochin, why are the tomatoes gone? I said, all things that grow come to an end. Tomatoes need a lot of sun and heat. Now there's less light and it's cooler. The kids still felt sad. I then told them, things don't always last forever because something else will grow there next season as long as we take care of them. I pointed to our pumpkin patch, a few feet away from the tomatoes. I said, see over there? In that same spot last year was garlic. This year it's our pumpkins. They just looked and said, oh cool, can we grow something else too? I said, of course. To the children, it may have just been another plant they're proud to grow. To me, it was another way they're learning to become urban land stewards. I want the children to feel that they have purpose on earth, no matter how small. I would like to introduce to you Esperanza and Gio Sanchez, a mom and son who are active participants at the farm-based wellness program. Here's what they had to say about it. Yo aprendí a cómo comer más saludable, más que nada por mis hijos, comer más saludable y aprender mucho de la agricultura, que no perdamos nuestro, de dónde venimos. Por ejemplo, comer las cantidades, que ya pues, no es necesario dejar de comer lo que uno come, ni es necesario volverse vegetariano tampoco. Más que nada hacer conciencia y, y saber mejorar cómo comer las cantidades. Eso para mí es lo más lo más más importante me gusta lo que más me gusta por ejemplo es que mi, a mis hijos los incluyo y ellos pueden ellos pueden venir a, a aprenden a sembrar aprenden la naturaleza de la cultura eso es lo que más me gusta y él siempre está siempre al pendiente ya va a llegar el día ya va a llegar la fecha de ya va a ser sábado porque vamos a la Juan y siempre está al pendiente <ríe> y he aprendido bastante la verdad me ha ayudado bastante y me gustó mucho The first time I came to the farm, I was kind of like scared because like, I thought that there was nothing to do. And then I met you, and like um, we started having fun together. Um, one of my favorite memories at the farm is um, use the water, clean up college, and we sold it to people. And then like um, like we had like a lot of college, and we sold out, like half of them, like like a bit more than half of them, really fast. Most of these have a lot of gold and a lot of silver. Oh heck no. I'm just like moving it around like so we can get on the back too. Another favorite part is like um when my first time when I tried um kale. Um I tried kale for my very first time and then I and then I just loved it. I just loved it. Urban farming is rooted in community. It's up to us what we want to cultivate and share with our people. Thank you for watching.
Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who watched that video. And so now it's time for a live Q&A. If you have any questions related to the video or just my farm experience or the farm in general, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, there's a question about um, how you winterize the garden. Is that something you could show oh, us yeah. and tell us about? Yes. So winterizing, good question. So if you'd like to follow me, I'll show you a prime example of what we're doing right now. Right behind me looks like just bare open land over here, but Right beside this area are two big piles. And this was formerly where all of our tomato plants were growing. And because they're already done for the season, what we do is that we pull everything from the root, including any extra weeds that were lying around. And what we're doing now is redefining any of the rows that have been flattened out throughout the season due to rain or just simply stepping on it. And afterwards, what we do is we get a bunch of leaves and we cover this whole area completely because we want to encourage organic matter to decompose in our soil. And then by next spring, we'll remove all that excess leaves and put it back in our compost bin so it can actually be made into compost and then it can be introduced back into the soil. Cool. Um, we have some more questions coming in. Um, folks are wondering how you started your farming journey. I know you spoke to that a little bit in the video, yes. but we'd love to hear more. So starting my, fa oh, my family, <laughs> starting my farming journey, it's a bit complex. Um, I like to tell people that sometimes I have a list of things I want to do in life and I have a list of where like the things I would least want to do and farming was actually one of them. And a lot of it was because my parents grew up with this taboo that fa uh, farming was something that wasn't considered a job. And so I've internalized that belief system. And I was a little bit um, not willing to be immersed in this type of environment, even though I live, I used to live five minutes away from here. And over time, someone introduced me to a farm apprenticeship back in April of 2020. And I wanted to quickly say no because that was my knee jerk answer. But then I was like, what do I have to lose? We're literally in the middle of a pandemic. People are rethinking about their lives. And so I wasn't rethinking mine, but I was willing to give myself the opportunity to delve into an environment that was treated as taboo. And ever since then, I've been extremely thankful for all the people that have supported my journey. I've built a lot of knowledge and met really nice and interesting people. And I'm just going to keep going for as long as I can. Honestly, I love it. So Sochi, can I ask you a question? Of course. Okay. So you, you produce all this amazing stuff. Do you, do you, do you give it away or do you sell it? How do you, how does it go out into the community? There is a process of, if you want to take 10 seconds of me walking. Yeah. So right in front of me is our weekly farm stand. It's available every Saturday from eight, no, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And what we do, a lot of the harvest that we collect, both at this farm and our other farms, we place them in bins and display them out and we sell them to really anyone who wants to come to our market. And if we have any excess produce left, we are more than willing to give it to soup kitchen or sell it at wholesale prices to mainly churches who are interested in buying in bulk and distributing it at their own independent soup kitchen. And most of our produce is really affordable. 
it's much cheaper than traditional um, grocery stores. And we also offer 50% off on all of our produce on those who are SNAP um, participants. Um, but if they're not applicable to receive uh, government uh, checks or um, stamps, we also um, we can speak to you in privately. And you know, if you really are struggling, we don't need to know your income. We don't need any verification. We just take your word. And we are able to produce um, provide you provide you produce at um, a discount. That's awesome. Wait, what a great what a great resource for that neighborhood to, to have you there. <laughs> Look at her stand yeah. and see of all the things that we buy. We have acorn squash, honey nut squash, butternut squash, peppers of different varieties here, collards, <laughs> kale, string beans, turnips. I feel like I might be about to jump in the car and race down to Ferry Road. <laughs> There is one disclaimer. All of our fruit that is sold at the farm is brought by Bishop Orchards. So we right. do promote other local farms here as well. We've also sold honey before in the past from the Honeybee Project. So if anyone is interested in selling their own products that are locally, um, locally made and grown, we can have it displayed at our farm. We just need to talk through first. <laughs> this is beautiful. Yeah. I'm wondering if if you have like a favorite um, crop that you like to grow um, on the farm. That's a good question, huh? You know, as much as I dislike tomatoes sometimes because they just like to grow all over the place, I really love that plant because one, it grows really tall. And two, I just love the smell of it. Like whenever my hands rub against the tomato, I know summer's in season. And also too, if you look close at it, look close at it enough, you will see that it has a golden tint to it in the sun. So I just really admire its complex structure and its smells. Yeah. And and what grows best, do you think, on the farm there? Is it is it tomatoes or is it something else? Well, honestly, everything. I can't, I really can't complain. It's really a matter of how well you take care of something. Like for instance, right here, we have a little patch of radishes. I planted this four weeks ago and the seeds were smaller than this, this, this yeah. little stem right here. And they bloomed within literally two days, but they're also very fast growing plants. I would say the slower ones are actually the flowers. They take at least two to three months before they start blooming. But once they bloom, they're ginormous. Like this one right here is called Celosia. And it's really similar to amaranth, but my favorite tint of it is the magenta, which is right behind me over here. Right. They grow like trees. <laughs> and the sunflowers. The sunflowers self seed themselves. During um, July and August, it's when it's its best look. Right now they're all pretty much dying because the weather's getting cooler right. but they're really beautiful so we've had a question come in which says do you do you have bees on site for pollination are there bees buzzing yes, around pollinating we don't introduce any bees they just come we have a variety of bees can i tell you the names of them no but they look different to me each time i look at them um and we have a lot of other variety of um critters too here so that's yeah. how we know that our land is healthy is that there's a lot of biodiversity. Right. So you actually get a lot of wildlife coming in because you've got a you've got a farm there. That's that's really cool. Yeah. I love the idea that you're enriching the neighborhood not just with the food, but also with the things that come in attracted by the food. So as long as they don't eat all your stuff. Actually, speaking of which, do you get problems with things eating your your produce? Do you get do you get rabbits and things coming in and eating stuff? And really good question. At this farm, we really don't struggle with pests unless they're pepper weevils, which are 
very small, like, well, it's really a mosquito that lays an egg and then the maggot, not the maggot, the, the larvae eats mm -hmm. the inside of the pepper. That's really our biggest pest struggle. But no, I don't see squirrels. Birds really eat any of our plants. If anything, they really will start biting at the sunflowers, but that's because they're extracting the seeds. Um, we have seen feral cats and possums, but they pretty much leave everything alone. We're surprised. We don't have any traps. We don't use any in, um, harmful pesticides. If anything, we use organic, just as like oils, vinegar, soaps, but nothing toxic to us or to the animals here. So that was a question that just came in from Peter on the Q&A was no pesticides, right? It's all, it's all, all organic. Yes. Yeah. Are there any more questions? No, yeah, I have plenty, but I wanted to give some other people some room because I'm doing a lot of talking right now. <laughs> honey, the honey bee is, is I saw the bee, the bee. That was so cool. It's still following. Yeah. <laughs> it's right behind the phone. I'm right. on the phone right now. <laughs> So, so, so where do you get water from? Do you get like rainwater yeah, or do you have like a sandpipe or? Oh, right. Yes. So we do have a, a specially designed irrigation system. So if you want to come closer. Yeah. So right here, what I'm grabbing is called drip tape. This is connected to a main water line, which is then connected to the city line. And this drip tape contains little holes right here that will drip water very slowly because when you water these plants, you don't want to splash them or inundate them with water. You want them to just slowly introduce it. And we would keep it on typically for a few hours at the time, maybe two in the morning and two in the um, evening. But lately this season, we had a little bit of an issue with um, this drip tape um, because we were having issues with how it was running throughout the farm. So we just had a lawn sprinkler and just move it around. So we try to have alternatives if something doesn't work at the farm. Right. So I've got a I've got a couple of questions in the Q and A from Sally. Um, one is, how do you decide what to plant on the farm? Yes. So during off season, we have a map that lays out everything that was grown throughout the season, including the summer and the fall, and then we determine what has um, been popular at the market or what are people looking for that wasn't at, available at the market. And we try to fuse those two um, needs and wants together and then uh, assess what uh, we will grow. So typically um, we have plenty of kale. That's probably our number one seller, tomatoes, green beans, chard, et cetera. And we also try to ensure crop rotation because you know, even though we are pest free, as I mentioned earlier before, we don't know on a microscopic level that has already infected our ground. So we try to ensure that what was grown, say here, the kale was here last year, can be in another area of the farm the following year. And then another question was, are you the, are you the only farm in Fairhaven or are there other ones um, that are around and about, including sort of small ones? Yeah, so for me, I'm going to get up, Jesse. <laughs> For me, I am one of two farmers here at Gather New Haven. Um, that's because we're full-time staff. But we, I honestly, the volunteers that come in or the interns, I consider them farmers. They might not get the yeah. title one officially, but in my eyes, everyone's an urban farmer. Right. And uh, is there anyone else that has a, a farming site in Fairhaven or are you, you, are you it? Are you the Fairhaven farm? We're the only farms. Yeah, everyone right. else has community gardens, which is different. Yeah, yeah. Are there many community gardens that Gather is stewarding across the city? Oh yes, we have a separate program called Community Gardens at our organization. We manage up to 50 to 60 community gardens throughout the season by someone named Eliza Cadwell. And we, we do collaborate a bit on our program because obviously she borrows a lot of our tools or vice versa. And we do share a lot of experiences together, except more it's more focused on independent communities while here we're serving for all communities. Yeah. And it's it's all produce. You don't have any livestock, any chickens or anything there. This is 
that is a very common question if we have chickens. And I like to say no. <laughs> I can't <laughs> myself working with livestock, I'll be honest. Having vegetables is much easier personally. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, chickens, I keep chickens and chickens are, chickens are a, yeah, they're a handful of chickens. So. <laughs> People love them. They love the eggs, but yes, it's their work. So, and it looks like you have your hands more than full with all the produce. So, was there another question? I can't hear. Okay. No, that wasn't. That wasn't. That was just me talking. Part of being an urban farm is dealing with random noises and loud yeah. times. Yeah. So do you have a lot of people, I mean, it, I, there was a bit of an answer to this in the video, but do you have a lot of people who are just walking by and they see you there and they're like, what, what are you doing in that garden? And, and how, how, how much follows from that? You know, when somebody comes and they see you, is there a track whereby they end up eventually farming with you and volunteering with you? That's a good question. Um, I would say a portion of people are interested to come work as volunteers yeah. or simply just want more. I think part of what's increased more people to stop by is if you want to take a look around, we have a wire fence now. Just nice. last year, all of this had a bunch of brush and trees and weeds. Like you literally could not see past the street. And I think that was the problem. A lot of people thought we were a private farm because we also lack signage. And so people just avoided this. But once this was open, you can literally see what's in front of you. And people will say, who are you? Or what are you doing? And then I'll just give a little bit of a background story about myself or the nonprofit. And they usually give their advice as like they come. A lot of people actually come from um, agricultural backgrounds, especially the Spanish speaking communities. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll just give their story like the one I mentioned in my video, Doña Cotilde. Literally this where this car is here, the red car yeah. right across that sidewalk where I met her and ever since then she's been periodically visiting me and just having conversation with me right um lots of questions coming in are there are there plant friends that you like to grow, grow together are there what plant friends I'm not sure I know what a plant <laughs> friend is but anyway like companion you do any companion planting like plants that like planting. to grow there we go other? yes I think the only one that I personally do, well, I want to say personally, what I'm told to do is um, basil and tomato. Mm. Really, that's about it. I know we do want to incorporate corn one day and more beans. So I would like to do a three sisters crop. We already mm. grow a bunch of squash. So I would really like to incorporate more of like indigenous or other cultural practices that have historically worked. Mm. So we, we are trying to be more actively immersed of what people, what knowledge people can bring to us and vice versa, because that's part of um, reinforcing the idea of community here. Right. Can you show uh, us some that are still growing that you're excited to, to harvest or some things that'll yes, go late into like the to season? I have a little story right here. So all this um, lush green here is Italian string beans. Let me see if there's anyone here. So uh, what I like about the story behind this is that a couple weeks ago, there was a, a woman who just introduced herself and she was like, I can't believe how big this little green bean patch is here. And I'm like, no one really points out how big this area is. She's like, um, her mother who immigrated from Italy had brought these specific green bean seeds to um, the farm and she handled, she handed these seeds over to our past farm manager who was Jocelyn Tidwell. And we hadn't used the seeds last year, but Jonathan and I were just experimenting with random things that were um, hand labeled. And we planted it and they just came out. And she was just so happy to know that part of her heritage is at our farm. Right. That's really cool. Do you, do you, do you sow most of your plants are seeds or do you grow seedlings and then and then plant out how do you how do you do that yes it depends i i make sure i read the back of seed packets often because it gives for specific specific directions of um the how well it grows whether it's direct seed or seedlings so with beans it's better to direct seed while if we're growing say beets or chard it's better if they start off as seedlings because their leaves are so delicate and 
in the beginning of the season, te uh, temperatures tend to fluctuate. So we want to increase their ability to survive. And that's why we have them in the greenhouse. Right. And do you do you save the seeds? Do you sort of bank your seeds or do you have to buy them new each year? How do, do you are you are you circulating stuff? Um, we try to save certain seeds, especially these beans, because they were so successful. They're going to naturally dry out on its own on this vine. And so we will definitely save these. Um, the kale, the typically we buy them from Johnny Seeds or other organic seed companies. But right. also our flowers here, we try to save them as much as I can, especially I'm a bias. I really love flowers. So I try to save any dry stem on it and see how much we can grow because I am interested in filling up our greenhouse and make it a, like a mini botanical garden and use that to sell at the farm stand. Great. Should we take a look in the greenhouse? It looks like there's the not a lot growing. A yeah, empty, but see, we the green, can... <laughs> see the greenhouse. <laughs> Do you ever use the greenhouse for um, growing crops like over the winter at all or into like extending season? Yes. <laughs> I like to um, say another funny story here. We talked about pests and I feel like I omitted a really big um, truth here. So this past season, we had uh, a mouse infestation, just to say the yeah. least. And a lot of it was because there was just leftover seeds and just a lot of things that mice can feed on and it's really warm so perfect combination yeah. is for them and so we made sure to not grow anything in here this season just because we weren't sure if the soil was good enough to grow and we didn't want to introduce anything to humans and so right now what we just cleared everything out here and next season we're going to actually take out all the soil out and replace it make sure it's healthy and this is where possibly our future botanical garden will be. If not, typically we have things that are big and viney like cucumbers or tomatoes. This is perfect for them. Yeah, I can see the, the remains of maybe what was used to string up some climbing yeah, plants. Yeah, that was for tomatoes, yes. And also this is the area where we store all our seedlings in the beginning of April and May. So actually, while you're talking about soil, um, you know, how much did they have to improve the soil here when they started the, the farm? Is it literally what was there on the ground when, you, oh, when, when the farm started or? You can't do that. No. So what we do no. is we send soil tests to a lab out in the Midwest. And right. what they do is they assess the fertility and any excess or um, a lack of certain minerals, minerals, and from there, we will create a special cocktail of fertility. And yeah. then anything like kelp, blood meal, azomite, all of those things will create actual fractions and make um, a blend of it. And then we just spread it across the farm. So right. we do an animal soil test because, you know, a certain vegetable may take up of a certain mineral. We're not sure. We can't always see everything. So we try to scientifically assess our soil. Right. And do you, do you till the soil? Or is it, are you sort of no-till? Um, it's a blend of both. It depends on the crop that we're growing. We do, we are trying to incorporate more of a no-till because we're, um, Jonathan has a better understanding of the, the microorganisms that are important in the soil. And if you till it, you might disturb its natural um, ecosystem in there. So we're right. experimenting um, on our farm, no-till versus till in a way. And that's what farming is, it's a lot of experimenting. Yeah. So what else haven't we seen that we should see? Let me see. Well, actually, speaking of friend plants, um, there are some things that just grow naturally next to um, some of our vegetables here. So right here, some people may not no, but for me, this is culturally important, is a tomatillo. Uh -huh. So these were self-seeded, and they pop out throughout the farm, and they do really well next to them. So you don't, there's no fruit in there now, but this is just the casing of the tomatillo. Once it's big enough, the, 
the casing here will actually start peeling off the tomatillo. I want to see if there's a full one here, but Maybe no. This one? Oh, yeah, right here. Perfect example. Yeah. Right here. Yep, it's really good to make salsas, roast them. Yeah. Beautiful plant. Oh, oh, yes. Speaking of seeing something, I would love to see, love everyone to see our watermelon patch. So to the naked eye, this might look like a bunch of weeds, which they are. Um, however, there are watermelons growing in between. And the reason why we don't heavily weed is because the leaves are so fragile, we might end up killing all of our watermelons. So you can see right here, here's one of many watermelons that are growing here. <laughs> And um, they usually get about this size between both of my hands. So this one's still pretty small. I know this has a sunspot, but it's not ready yet. And these watermelons were actually self-seeded. They were planted last year, but our issue with it is that the watermelon were either underripe or over fermented. So we never had an actual edible watermelon. But this year we actually were able to better assess the fruit and they're completely edible now. So our plan for next year is to actually grow cantaloupe, pumpkin, and other hearty round vegetables and fruits yeah. that grow on the ground. I love how they're just tucked away in the weeds there. That's so cool. <laughs> so I'm um, wondering, as we're wrapping, like, what are some ways that folks can get involved or support the work that y'all are doing? Of course, we have plenty of volunteer opportunities. People don't have to exclusively come to this farm or farm in general. If they wanna to go to community gardens or even our wellness program, just advertise my program on the side. Um, we have a lot of opportunities for people. If you just wanna send a general email, we can just have a conversation and just see what you like, what days work for you. We're extremely flexible. How many, how many pounds of, of produce do you think you produce a year? Historically, reading the paper, it's about 15,000 pounds a year. Wow. Yes. My word. <laughs> so I'm, I'm getting a message that we are, we're up with time now, um, which is a pity because we could go for a lot longer hearing about this farm. It's absolutely spectacular. Thank you, Sochi, for Thanks. spending some time with us. Thank and, you, and what I'm going to do is just in closing, say um, thank you, everyone, for attending today's Fiesta Latina programming. Um, you can join us throughout the day for other programs or you can check the Peabody YouTube channel for recordings of uh, this year's events. Um, certainly, I'm going to come back and want to watch this one again because I'm going to need to get more information about farming. So thank you. <laughs>